The 1970s, what a time to be alive if you like old junk that's actually at the time new junk, so that, that doesn't actually work. The 2020s, what a time to be alive if you like old junk. Actually, I guess there's any time to be alive if you like old junk because there's always going to be something old. But I've just got old electronics magazines from the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. They're absolutely incredible. They are sort of like time capsules. You get to see all of the beautiful different listings and advertisements which are really of the time as well as all of the amazing projects that are available in there. For instance, this page that I've just come up against and it looks like some big funky aerial plans. I don't know, it's, it's funky regardless. There's a load of different titles of these magazines. For instance, the one in my hand, Practical Electronics. The slightly less specialist version, Everyday Electronics. What about Electronics Today International? There's loads of others and there are websites out there that have archived every single one of these. In fact, there's a link to a very good one below. Basically, all of these magazines have a bunch of different DIY electronic projects, ranging from frequency shifters, um, LCD panel meter, a whole gosh darn organ, yeah, you could build that. What we got in this one? We've got the Chronostop transistor assisted ignition for the latest model vehicle. Oh yeah, and we cannot forget about the amazing advertisements in there. For instance, this Maplin. And don't forget a nice list of what Marshalls has in stock. The most interesting projects in old electronics magazines for me are, well, the musical instrument ones, especially the electronic musical instruments. On this channel, we've already covered a number of these, including the SWTPC Psych Tone, the Powertran Transcendent, which was covered in ETI, a drum machine from Practical Electronics, and a Hooting Owl from Everyday Electronics. But it doesn't stop there. There is literally a mountain of these projects out there. For instance, the PE Mini Sonic. Look at that beauty. The Practical Electronics Sound Synthesizer. This is a modular synthesizer, and it's spans over a number of magazines. This one's a bit of the beauty from the late 60s, the Glissando vibe. Ooh, there's a whole load of string ensembles. This whole binder of Electronics Today International covers a lot of the Digisound series. That is a modular synthesizer as well. And then we've also got this big old chunk of electronics, which is also a DIY electronics project from a magazine. The magazine in question is Elector. And Elector started out in the 1960s in the Netherlands, and then in the 70s started scoping out into other languages and being published in different countries. This specific issue is February 1982, and it looks like they are covering a battery charger. Ooh, the cool thing about Elector projects is the really strong style. For instance, all of the circuit boards are blue with a black and white silk screen. Oh, lovely. If we have a look at this project, which is a guitar preamp, you'll see it's got the characteristic blue circuit board. But then if we look at this panel right here, you'll notice that it's got a striking resemblance to whatever this thing is. Ooh. This is a DIY modular synthesizer series by C. Chapman called the Elector Formant. The project was released in a number of Elector issues from the start of 1977, each magazine covering a module. Then Elector did a compilation book, much like many of the other magazines, where it just basically compressed all of the sections about the Formant synthesizer from all of the magazines into a book. I don't have that book, that's why it's a scraggly old printout here. But the special thing about these DIY electronics projects is they're extremely well documented. That's because they've basically been put together month by month with a magazine article. The link to a digital version of this book is available below, but it basically covers every single aspect of the modular synthesizer. So you can literally read through this, get all of the circuits, look at the descriptions, and then start building yourself. In fact, I've already done a few videos over on the museum channel about getting this thing ready for playing in the museum. And in these videos, I look through this and comparing them up to what is going on here. When I got this, it was a little bit of a punt. You've got to understand that every single one of these modular synthesizers are completely different different. That's because they've been built by hobbyists, either looking through this book or collecting the magazine issues. There is no telling of the skill set of the hobbyist who made it. They could be complete novices or they could be absolute experts. So the build quality vastly varies and I've spoken about that in the Powertran Transcendent video as well as the SWTPC Psych Tone video where we find out in that video that it was actually built by a bunch of 13 year old kids at school. And props to them for making it so well. Except the person who made the case, very nicely I must say, built it in such a way that you just cannot take it apart, which is a bit of a shame, but at least it worked. With all that in mind, when you search up Elector Formant, you'll notice that every single picture of every single Formant synthesizer looks completely different. Well, yeah, that's because they were built 
week by week, month by month. So different builders built them in a different way. For instance, it's not completely clear from looking at this modular whether it was actually all built by the same person at the same time. The story to this is a little bit of a mystery. So this is the back of the synth. You'll notice it's got the Elector Blue circuit boards. I have modified it a little bit and I've spoke about that in the other videos which are linked below. So it didn't come exactly like this. It was a little bit more hodgepodge than this when I got it. It's cleaned up a bit. I have fixed it here and there. I had to swap a few jack sockets and stuff. If you want to watch stuff about that, then go and check it out below. But the thing is originally these circuits connected via these connectors here. You'll notice that there are an awful lot of pins on these things. That's because the formant was intended to be a semi-modular synthesizer. That means a lot of the connections would have been made around the back. However, in this synthesizer's instance, all of the connections have been removed from the back and they're all on the front. Uh, there's even signs of some uh, jack sockets put here and there as modifications to make it work like that. But it got me thinking because a lot of these connectors have actually got their wires soldered in on the side. So they're not actually using the connectors anymore. So it makes me think that a lot of these modules were built maybe by somebody else. And then this was got hold of by somebody else and then shoved into this rather hodgepodge case just to get working. But it works so it doesn't really matter. And that's what I love about these old DIY synthesizers is because they're completely different. You're never really sure of the actual story of them, but they've got a lot of character. This is by no means the biggest formant in the world and it's not that small small lever, it's actually got four oscillators. But without any more talking, let's plug it in and give it a go. So let's begin. Remember, this is a mini jack synthesizer, which is a bit of a shame, but the bonus to that is we can use Eurorack stackable cables, which is pretty cool, actually. So um, let's plug the output of this VCO in first. This right up here is the uh, wire that's going straight to the output of the synthesizer. Oh, that's a square wave. Sine wave, triangle, ramp, other ramp, and square wave with pulse with modulation yeah baby take it out of the triangle wave output plug it into the PWM so let's do some bog standard stuff to have a look at the other modules we'll plug it into the input external signal input of the VCF voltage control filter and uh, we'll plug the output of the voltage control filter into the output this is a 24 dB filter. I've done a video on this filter over on the museum channel whilst fixing this up and it's made from operational transconduction amplifiers. It's pretty standard. Turn up the resonance. Reduce the poles to free pole. Whack it straight up to 24, right. Now, before we go any further, we're going to try the RFM filter. This is basically free bandpass filters that phase against the original signal. It's pretty funky. So we'll just plug in this simple square wave first. Normal signal. So this RFM is pretty much a funky take on EQ. I've got to be honest, I haven't actually tried the ring modulator since I fixed it, so let's um let's give it a go. Put it for a bit of reverb. Very nice. So the noise module has an output of white noise, pink noise, 
which is basically just different filter versions of noises and then a random voltage output. So we're going to actually plug the random voltage into the input of the ring modulator, I guess. So we got this. I think I've got to adjust that random voltage output. I don't think it goes very high, so maybe I need to do a couple of adjustments. I think that one might even be a stripboard layout. It looks like there's a preset potentiometer on the back, so I'll have to adjust that a little bit later. It's a little bit low and not that interesting. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna wire in the control voltage input of the VCA, and we're gonna wire that into the pitch input of the BeatStep Pro. Very nice. The waveform processor isn't sadly working right now, which is a bit sad. Got to fix that. So there'll be another video on that before I get it wired up at the museum. Mixing the oscillators together. External signal.
So all in all, this old DIY synthesizer is pretty cool. It's got a very similar character to a lot of other synthesizers. For instance, the filters and stuff are based on the OTAs that are very similar to a lot of other synthesizers. However, saying that, some of the modules are pretty unique, uh, including the RFM, the waveform processor, the SEQ ADSR, which doesn't work at the minute, and also the internal patching, which sadly isn't present in this synthesizer. It wasn't present when I got hold of it, and it would have been far too much of a faff to get it all built in and working. So I think it's good as it is. This will be able to be played over at this museum's Not Obsolete. Uh, the next open day, I think, is February the 26th. It will be set up in some sort of fashion. The WAV version of the jam is available to download over on Patreon, as well as a bunch of funky samples from this thing that you could download and chop up and do stuff with. If you want to see and download extra things at the same time as supporting these videos and the museum, then go and check it out over on PayPal or Patreon. And regardless, there's loads of links in the description to things that I've mentioned in the video. Anyway, that's it from me and the Foreman Synthesizer for today, so yeah, don't be scared to try it.